Well, welcome everyone to the uh, AERA 2021 uh, training session for our virtual annual meeting. Uh, I want to introduce my uh, a collaborator and of course our leader in all things meeting, Robert Smith, AERA Director of Meetings. Uh, we will just briefly introduce this session, uh, which is oriented to chairs, discussants, and presenters. Uh, I saw in one of the notations already in the chat, someone saying, is this the second one of these? And the answer is uh, yes. Uh, but the reason for doing these live, even though the recordings are all available on the AERA website, um, uh, within the next day after this session is to bring new questions up uh, to have you feel part of the process and to uh, engage you with having the opportunity for live discussion and questions and interactions um, around various topics from general orientations to um, two of those to three that we held on the creation of an interactive presentation a mode of presentation uh, that you can use in during your um, participation in the annual meeting if you are giving a paper at a symposia you have that option or if you are given uh, giving a paper at a paper session um, a poster session or to pick up some of the content that you might share um, in a uh, in a roundtable session so there are three of those already on the website uh, next week, we will be holding two sessions um, for anyone who wishes to join, uh, but those are uh, will be oriented for first-time attendees and uh, first-time members or, or both. Uh, we realized from many of the questions that were being asked over many of these orientations, there were some basic ones like, what happens in a round table? or uh, what happens at a paper session, or what do I do if I'm chairing a symposia, uh, that really is uh, quite, quite like happens at an ARA annual meeting. And indeed, we selected this platform because it's a destination where you should experience uh, and, and have many of those informal as well as formal programmatic opportunities uh, that those of you who have been to other AERA uh, annual meetings, uh, we like to think know and uh, love well. I say love well. Um, of course, one might view that as uh, something that uh, an executive director might say at the introduction of any session, um, but we are here for you to create this experience with you. I am Felice Levine broadcasting from home. Certainly your executive director uh, for the purposes of the meeting, and I like to thank for the field, whether you are a um, member or not. Briefly, we are asking you to, uh, to post any questions you might have as soon as you have them in the uh, Q&A function. The chat function interferes with accessibility, so the chat can communicate with panelists, but is not that live chat that some of you undoubtedly have used in many, many contexts without recognizing that the use of that chat uh, may limit um, uh, accessibility for those who are uh, reading uh, closed captioning or using other modalities. As with all ARA events, um, uh, we have ASL interpreters too, who will uh, shift uh, shift off about every 20 minutes for uh, during this session. Wendy and Jamie, thanks for joining us again today. And uh, Nanette is doing the closed captioning. Uh, for those who are less familiar with uh, Zoom, if you pick up the live transcript uh, box on your right, as I am doing but won't do, it'll pop up the closed captioning if you wish to um, uh, uh, read the live closed captioning as well. The heart of this session is directed to how the platform works and how you, when you are chair or presenter or commentator, uh, will um, experience the, uh, uh, the virtual annual meeting. This is not radically different from other experiences you have had uh, participating or presenting or teaching 
on other platforms, whether it's WebEx or Zoom or GoToMeeting, it is better in its functionality. It is more stable. When you come to the, the meeting, you're coming to a destination where you can easily navigate without having to save software or URLs and try to figure out where I'm going next and what is my role. So the purpose of this session is uh, to really provide an in-depth opportunity for you to be exposed to what is uh, what we like to think is a terrific opportunity and experience that will um, leave the burdens to one side for you and maximize uh, your experiences um, as, a, uh, uh, as a participant in a session. We will also, Nathan, do you wanna bring that agenda up for one moment? Uh, it's posted um, already. Um, I think it was in chat, maybe it was in Q and A. Essentially, as I've just said, uh, the heart of the meeting will be on the virtual platform and, and, and what you as a presenter um, uh, will, will experience essentially. And there's a series of demos around that. Then we will turn to Emily Biddix, who is our accessibility consultant for this meeting. ARA has been long committed to accessibility and access uh, with um, attention to the kinds of supports and services persons with disabilities uh, that we should provide to make for a, an inclusive meeting for, per, uh, for persons with disabilities. We, in each of these sessions, devote time to that because that is part of our climate and culture. And we want all of us, those who are delivering the meeting, presenting or attending, to share in that commitment and that experience. And there's lots of opportunity as you see on the agenda or you read on the agenda um, uh, for uh, a Q and A and for interaction with you. I'll turn this over to Robert and then he will turn it over to our, our Scarrett group. That is the company that we engage because their virtual platform has been a secure and powerful environment uh, for some 12 years now, way before we all knew we needed virtual platforms. Robert. Thank you, Felice, and good day to everyone who's joined us today. I'd like to- Microphone, thank, Robert. Yeah, I'd like to thank you and uh, welcome you to our session today. Uh, as Felice said, we're gonna cover some things uh, as being in, in the platform and our colleagues at Scarrett will uh, do that very shortly. Um, very quickly, in 17 short days, we'll be starting the annual meeting. If you've not had an opportunity to register, please do. We'd like to get everyone registered by uh, the 1st of April so that you'll have an opportunity to go into the system and uh, modify your profile and look around the system and be familiar with it when the meeting starts on the 8th. And with that, I'll turn it over to our colleagues at Scare it. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel, and I'm with the Scare it Group. So we're going to go over the virtual conference center, as well as a key few points that we would like to share. Um, if someone's sharing the agenda, I will take over and show the virtual conference center. Thanks, Nathan. So on my screen, I do have up the virtual conference center, but before we log in and start to tour it, I want to go over a few pieces of information. The first is in this demonstration, we're going to be going over two different types of live sessions. It's going to be important to know how both of them function because some session types will utilize both. For example, if your session has a larger group to begin with, but then you break out into smaller groups, you may utilize both session styles. So we will need to make sure everyone is comfortable with both formats. The second point is all presenters are going to be sharing their presentations by way of sharing their screen. We will show you where those icons are located in today's demonstration. But regardless of where you're building your presentation, whether it be in the iPresentation interactive feature 
or in PowerPoint, or even if it's a browser on your computer, you will be sharing your screen for all methods of presenting. The next is that your presentation therefore will not be built in the virtual conference center or even stored in the virtual conference center. You don't need to worry about uploading it at all. Just sharing your screen is all you'll need to do. And to reiterate what Robert just mentioned about registration, it is crucial that everybody register individually because you will not be able to share your login credentials with any other co-authors or presenters on your particular presentation. Everyone will need to have their own unique login, so every single person will need to register for the conference. With that being said, I will start the tour of the Virtual Conference Center. On the screen right now is the login page, so you will have the opportunity to enter your email and password here. That information is going to be sent out shortly, and in that email, it'll tell you when you have access to login. The middle button on the screen will allow you to log into the platform, and the first page you'll land on is the landing page. There will be pieces of information here that you can click into the day of the conference, and the bottom middle tile will take you into the virtual lobby. Before you present, we recommend reviewing our system requirements and system checks that will be sent out. Especially if you're joining from your university or work office, your IT department may have some of these system requirements blocked. And if that's the case, it may take some time to um, have permission to view them. If it has, if you have the ability to disconnect from a VPN before you join, that would also be advisable. If you're logging in from home and you have a few different devices in your house using your internet, we recommend disconnecting those as well to give your computer optimal bandwidth. These aren't 100% requirements, but it may make your experience run a little bit smoother. Now that we're on the lobby page of the Virtual Conference Center, it does look like that of a hotel lobby with some additional digital branding opportunities for sponsors. And there are two key features in this platform, the top and bottom toolbar. These toolbars will be in every room of the Virtual Conference Center, so it will be important to know what they do and use them for navigation purposes. In the bottom toolbar, on the left-hand side, there's an icon that reads Map. When you click on the map, there's a variety of pins, and each pin is going to bring you to a different room in the Virtual Conference Center. And we will click into one of these in just a moment. Staying in the bottom toolbar and moving over to the right-hand side, there's an icon that reads Profile. This profile is going to be important for any presenters or speakers if you wish to build a speaker profile that will also appear on the agenda. To do that, after you click the profile icon, in the middle screen that pops up, you'll click on edit profile information. And here, your first name, last name, and pronoun are going to automatically populate from whatever you typed in at your registration process. However, you will be able to edit them here if you choose to. There's also a location on the right-hand side to upload a profile. And at the top of this window, there's a tab that reads bio. And if you would like to include a speaker bio here, this is where you would do so. So any information you upload in your user profile will carry over into your speaker bio that will show in the agenda, which we will get to shortly. Any sessions that are taking place during the conference can be accessed from the top toolbar. At the top toolbar, there's an icon that says today's events. The events taking place that day will appear here and any session that is currently live or one that you can go in and view will have a blue play button to the left of the title. If it has anything other than a blue, a blue play button, it may be too early for you to enter that session. So check back a little bit closer to the start time. There's a search bar in the top right corner. 
You can use this to narrow your search for the titles of the session, keywords, or even presenters and authors' names. Next to today's events in this window in the center of the screen <clears throat> is upcoming events. When we're in the time of the conference and all the sessions are populated here, there's going to be thousands listed. If you would like to start adding a few of them to your particular schedule, it may be used as an organization tool. There will be an icon to the left of each session that says add and adding it to your session will populate it into your own schedule to make it easier to find. But once again, you can always use the search bar if you're looking for a particular event. Before we go into a live session setting, I'll go back down to the map and show you an example of what it looks like to enter another room by clicking on a pin. So by clicking the map in the bottom toolbar, I'm going to locate the pin towards the center of the map that reads virtual session rooms. And clicking this pin will take me into a new room of the virtual conference center. This room is going to be a second place that you can go to view the agenda. There is no new information here. It's just an additional place that you can access all the sessions. So now that we've done a brief overview of what the platform looks like, we will start to show you what the live session settings look and feel like. So the first one we will click into is, is an example of what the paper sessions, round table sessions, and poster sessions will look like. This is also going to be used for any smaller symposium sessions, as well as any breakouts off of a main session. So I've clicked the play button next to the session I want to go into. And the next screen I'm brought to will prompt me to type in how I want my name to be displayed. And I'll turn off my camera on Zoom so I can show you what it looks like in this session. At the bottom of the screen, there's a blue play, a blue join meeting button. And there's also the option to turn your microphone and camera on and off. So on the screen, you can see my colleague Mackenzie has also joined. So I'll walk you through what the different icons here will appear like. On the bottom right corner, there's an icon with four squares. This will allow you to change your view. So I toggled my view to give both myself and Mackenzie an equal amount of the screen. If one of us started to share our screen, I may choose to blow that up so it's full screen and easier to see the content. And once I share my screen, I'll show you what that looks like. So over here on the left hand side, there's a chat bubble icon. It's not allowing me to click that right now. I apologize, but that would be where you can do a text chat. And next to that is the share your screen icon. It looks like a computer monitor with an arrow. So if I click on this, it'll prompt me to select which screen I would like to share. So if I had a presentation up on one side of my window, I could click on that screen to share that window or what, whatever the content is that you're sharing. So if I open up the screen, I would have full control over what the attendees are viewing. You can see I'm navigating my cursor around on the screen here. If I wanted that to be full screen, I just have to click on it and everyone can see it full screen as well. Each individual user has the ability to change their own view. So if someone had an interpreter on the screen and they preferred that they were taking up the full screen or perhaps they wanted to toggle view so they could equally see the content being shared and the interpreter, they could have the ability to change their screen to their own personal preference. One other icon I will show today is in the bottom right corner, there's an, a menu icon with a few dots. Clicking on the option that reads speaker stats will list everybody that's currently in that session. So here you can see that myself and Mackenzie are listed here. If this particular session had any smaller subsessions or breakouts, the way to access those would be in the top toolbar. This is going to apply to any session you attend in the conference. So if you're looking for a breakout, you'll click in the top toolbar where it says the word breakouts. And any session listed here will specifically be a breakout session 
for the events that you're currently viewing. So if the presenter at any time said, we're going to now break out into smaller groups, and you click on that breakout icon in the top toolbar, any breakout listed will only be visible to the other attendees in that session with you. And you'll simply click on the blue play button to enter whichever one you choose, just as you would to enter the live session to begin with. So at this time, I'll pause Mackenzie and we can go over any questions that are related to this virtual platform of a live session. Thanks, Rachel. Um, one question I do keep seeing, and this is one I believe for Robert and Felice, is just there are a lot of uh, people asking if they can get more information on the time that they have to present in their sessions. So I don't know if there is a breakdown of how long they have for each particular session for their presentation. Yes, um, uh, we will post, uh, I suppose I'll say tomorrow, <laughs> um, what has been longstanding ARA practice. Nothing about this virtual environment actually changes that at all. Uh, there's guidance about uh, for uh, paper uh, uh, sessions, which is essentially um, whether one, two, or three presenting authors, uh, 10 minutes per um, uh, brief overview by the chair and uh, <clears throat> if there's a discussant, uh, an opportunity for the discussant to talk. Chairs can vary. They can take questions for each paper in sequence or some wait until the end, particularly if there's a tie-in across, um, uh, across papers. Symposia vary quite a bit depending upon the nature of the submission and the plan for that submission. Uh, if, it, if the symposia or session was accepted through the submission process, if it's an invited symposia, they too can vary. Sometimes it's a brief lightning talk of three or four people talking for three or four minutes and then open discussion, moderated discussion through the chair. You should have known that if you're in a session submission in terms of how the construction of it, AERA doesn't have a mechanistic um, on-demand notion of how the symposia um, can or should unfold. Some have underlying papers, some are brief presentations on topics, and we sent an email as we do every year to chairs last week, it was the same letter, except it probably had the word virtual in it, that essentially asked that chair to uh, communicate with the participants and make known what might be um, certainly less, less in your active RAM, uh, uh, to put it in computer terms, because you all submitted last July and to, uh, and to have that discussion. Roundtables are not a moment for formal presentation of papers. Roundtables are aiming to be, just as described in, in the call, an opportunity for interaction. There's no discussant, there's a moderator chair interaction around your paper. And that typically takes the form of each of you maybe speaking for three or four minutes to kind of get your perspective on the table around a shared topic of that round table. And then the moderator kind of introducing questions that you all might discuss. You might have issues you wanna discuss with each other. And keep in mind if you, uh, if you have been to a round table, um, at AERA, which are quite popular, and this reform was introduced in 2010, you recognize that people attend and come around the table, essentially, so that while, while the, those attendees don't jump in before you all jump in, you kind of get the issues on the table. Uh, uh, the attendee then might say, well, I'm working on X and I'm interested in particularly how you've approached that issue. Those descriptions we will, um, uh, post. Uh, the poster session e even operates much like the poster session. Each poster presenter will be in a room, let's say like uh, Rachel alone um, uh, 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 before she was joined. And um, so envision that if you were in a big ballroom and you, were, you had a poster session that, uh, thank you, that's great, <laughs> that until someone comes, into the, comes up to your poster, you're not going to start 
describing anything, but if you use the interactive presentation, all of your tiles will be up and the dynamic nature of those will be available. If for some reason you, and you would bring that up on a share screen, if for some reason you decide not to do it in that way, which I heartily, I heartily recommend you just, you decide to do it in that way, in that sc shared screen, whatever you're showing, you would not necessarily like if that were the poster welcome, the meeting will begin momentarily until someone or ones come up to your poster. If you use the interactive presentation, uh, you, someone will be able to see all of your pieces of your poster at once. They might look at it because you've shared the screen and they can make it big. Or they might ask, well, would you give me an overview of what you were trying to do here? And then you might, you know, you might go through it sequentially, or you might decide to emphasize one or two parts, just as you would, but better, <laughs> just as you would, not saying that virtual is better than place-based, but just the flexibility and the dynamic is just as you would if you were in a big ballroom with a lot of round tables, but you wouldn't have all that background noise, or if you were in a poster session, because we've made these one hour. So there are less concurrent and less concurrent in the same room. They still are, but uh, they will be, um, uh, the round tables and the paper sessions will be recorded and all of your presentations will be available in the gallery if you choose to use the interactive presentation. I suppose when we moved to virtual, it was like, oh, is this gonna be really different? Or maybe, which is why I announced that we're gonna have special sessions next week for first time attendees. But believe me, if you've attended five times and you, and you wanna come, please come because these are the kinds of questions in addition to the fact sheets going up uh, that, we'll, you know, that we'll share with you. I do have a couple of other questions. Um, Rachel, a few people are asking when they will receive their login credentials. The login credentials should be sent out by the beginning of April. So as long as you are registered, you will receive an email with your login credentials. And then we also have um, people asking about breakouts and how they sign up for these. So for that, breakouts do have to be pre-scheduled with AERA. Um, so I believe you can reach out to Robert Smith if you are uh, requiring breakouts for your session. Yeah. And One other say, question. Let me just say on the breakouts, we think we caught them all because that, those were fundamental to how the sessions were submitted. If it's being submitted as a uh, structured roundtable session, that's how it was submitted. If it was being uh, submitted as a structured poster session, that was how it was submitted. If it is, let's say, uh, we have uh, uh, several sessions a, a two with work with ARA works in progress where um, there are two research handbooks where um, uh, the editors of those two handbooks, one on faculty of color and one on uh, 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 ed, uh, a new revision to the, or new, a new product from the sequence of handbooks that uh, ARA has had on ed policy so authors will be at tables, sometimes clusters of authors, and we very much invite attend. And so they're, they are structured as structured round tables. We very much invite attendees to those because then they can contribute to authors thinking about the further development of those works. Thank you. Um, and then just a couple other items. There were a couple of comments um, of attendees mentioning that Rachel and you shared your screen, uh, your camera turned off. So just to clarify that when you do share your screen, your camera will automatically turn off. If you want it to be on, you just need to click um, your camera back on. So you can have both your presentation and your camera on at the same time, or you can just show your presentation if you don't want to be on camera. Um, so either one will work. Another question, um, I believe this is for AERA as well. There are a couple of comments asking about pre-recording your presentation. I believe that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Felisa Robert, but all presentations should be done live um, and we are not playing pre-recorded presentations. Correct. Correct. Yeah, this is, uh, 
Um, I, indeed, I have to catch myself off and to say this is a live meeting. Uh, the place-based meeting is live too, but that's place-based. So we have a platform that's an environment you enter that will have all, will have wonderful program of uh, formal sessions, um, business meetings, receptions, um, lots of break time built into the schedule so that you can you can either go to a networking session or what you would learn from uh, in more detail from the attendee experience. You can catch up with people you want to catch up with by video uh, chat or by uh, text chat or both. Um, but it's uh, the whole meeting is live. All sessions, uh, all sessions uh, in the program, but poster sessions will be are, are being recorded and are available in uh, in the um, on demand um, library that so if there's something concurrent that you missed you can go and see it if you heard that something was great you could go back and see it um, uh, that will be available um, in the platform for registrants for um, uh, for one year so uh, that is, uh, I should say, um, it's, uh, I suppose, a little off point from the, this is oriented to chairs, discussants, and presenters. But we ask Garrett and work with them in not just the traditional that some associations do one month or sometimes less, but because we wanted our meeting during this COVID time to be maximally available to registrants who uh, end of semester, end of quarter, end of major research project, um, child care responsibilities looming large, other kinds of family care and other issues that even individuals themselves may be experiencing, uh, that we wanted registrants to be able to take whatever constitutes your break time and get the value from the meeting uh, that uh, was um, uh, was intended when we went virtual. So it's only available to registrants, but we will be, this asset will be available up to the next uh, annual meeting. Thank you, Elise. And then I do have one more question for you. We're getting a lot of questions here uh, for people who are asking when they'll get the link for their eye presentation and where they can upload that information. Yeah, that you should have gotten if you are the um, uh, first listed, I draw a distinction between, could be equal authors, but the first listed author uh, received an invitation last Monday uh, for any paper accepted in a paper submission. We are going to resend that probably tomorrow and we will be notifying all authors in a paper that the first listed author has received that. They can shift the responsibility and ask someone else to take the lead. You can share screen and all of you collaborate, but only one person sort of drives what I call it. One person's the artist. One person is in the studio, um, uh, sort of, uh, I call it the studio, but in the creation. Uh, space. There's an opportunity for an over, no, overall narration that you can upload from uh, iPhone. It can have more than one of you. So that invitation did go out. We did not send the invitation initially to those presenting papers in sessions. We did not do that initially because sometimes um, um, frequently in symposia, there might be a title without there necessarily being, it may be the title of a brief talk that didn't take the form of, um, uh, might be perspectives on um, X or Y or Z that was really intended to be more of a forum uh, than with an underlying paper. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions about that. Uh, we did that to not overassume. Um, but we will now overassume and make that an equal offering, an opportunity for anyone um, uh, uh, presenting a uh, uh, a paper in um, in a symposia, even if it's the more abbreviated 
um, a brief of paper that should be uploaded by the 25th of, of this month. So those invitations will go out again. There's been a dedicated box for I presentation that is uh, present, presentation dash gallery. Somebody will put it in the Q and A. Presentation dash gallery at ARA.net. Robert, did I remember that correctly? That is correct. That's a direct email. If you have any interest in this or you didn't receive something or you wanna talk with one of us, in the, gal in the gallery itself, when you're invited to create your presentation, there's a lot of help, including if you, you know, needed it, somebody could um, uh, <clears throat> you know, contact you. Um, we have a degree of proficiency that can support you. I put in a comment that one of our colleagues who did two papers in our invitational mode for the 2020 annual meeting that never happened. She is, uh, has two papers accepted for this year's meeting and we're gonna do a live demonstration that will talk a lot about uh, how to do it. She's gonna do it with one of her papers. You'll be able to see uh, the various ways she has designed her functionality. The only forewarning is, as she said to me on the phone on Friday evening, she just loves the functionality. So she was experimenting with a lot of things that of course one doesn't need to do, but she was having a good time and putting video clips from some interviews. Um, she actually took some pieces of a PowerPoint that she is intending to use the I presentation, but she used one of the sliders for a PowerPoint. So it's really quite simple to do much more. It's, um, it's much more discoverable. You'll have a unique um, citation and, um, and it's discoverable because on something like a PowerPoint or a poster, it really is just a one dimension. It doesn't have the, this is a, a web-based product. So it's discoverable through, uh, and you're discoverable and reachable <clears throat> uh, because there's an underlying metadata, um, which other modalities have. A handout doesn't have any underlying metadata. We're hoping that that'll be this coming Friday. I didn't say that at the outset because um, we're trying to uh, uh, mesh schedules and have it, um, far enough away that uh, even though we'll record it, but that, uh, you know, that, that it's uh, accessible um, to many of you live, because I think it's, uh, I think it'll be a, a, a valuable experience to see, uh, to see uh, an eye presentation done live, although it was done by the eye presentation folks last uh, Wednesday and Thursday. And you can see that in the recording I think seeing um, one of our own colleagues do it, and you can ask her any questions you'd like, will be uh, uh, a live happening in virtual space. And just uh, some more questions on the I presentation and the round table. Um, mm -hmm. We're getting questions if, if they should only use I presentation for the poster sessions or if they should use those for other sessions as well. We um, call it yeah, we call it I presentation because we, we think it should be used for any underlying presentation and especially anything with a paper. The gallery is a wonderful asset where uh, the 2020 gallery with 450 papers that we invited people to just try it with your 2020 papers at the annual meeting that was canceled, 450 of you did so. It's like the um, online paper repository it, after the meeting, it will sit on, uh, that piece will sit on um, uh, <clears throat> on the AERA, will be, remain within the gallery, but will also be uh, accessible as an open access product outside of the gallery. Uh, it's got many, many advantages, including a, a viewers of your presentation being able to contact you to set up live chats through your portal of choice. You can do word chats, you can do a text chats, you can do, uh, you can schedule video meetings if for, or uh, you can, if you're an author, you can schedule your own and then let's say send out word to, um, you know, through some SIGs or through a division that you're going to be um, um, doing a special focus on X, Y, and Z. You could do it with more than one of your colleagues. Um, uh, 
through that platform, each of you um, bringing up your presentations. So it's intended for, a, it's the, what I like to think, it's the presentation mode because it's web-based of uh, this century as opposed to the other kinds of um, modalities. If you still choose to do uh, PowerPoint, you can actually put your PowerPoint in there with a very, uh, with two very simple steps if you wanted to do so. This has a lot more dynamic to it. So we think it's really tailor-made for any form of um, um, paper presentation or really presentation. Those who are giving um, uh, lectures or talks have asked, well, do I have to do it? Of course, you don't have to do anything. You could use transparency, for, you know, uh, transparencies or um, uh, any modality that you might like, um, uh, including, uh, you know, including PowerPoint, but we, it is not intended uh, for a poster session only. It's really, it's intended for any form of paper or really presentation of, of research, whether it's theoretical, methodological, or empirical. Um, and then just two more um, that I think we should touch on is um, we have some people asking for their sessions that have multiple presenters, what the plan is for them to be able to communicate ahead of time with each other and organize a plan for their session. Additionally, there are a lot of questions about roundtables specifically and what the plan is for those. So if we could get a breakdown of how the session should run, I think that would be helpful for everybody. Right, we're gonna post that also, but we do ask the chair, whether it's the chair of a paper session, a round table, or a symposia to reach out and contact those participating just as would have happened some days before a place-based meeting. Even if you can all meet up, if your event is on the 11th, you can meet up within the gallery with a video chat for as long as you would like on the 9th or the 10th. We don't uh, anticipate you would wanna do it a moment before, just like you wouldn't uh, you know, in a place-based meeting. So a round table is um, in uh, this year, round tables and posters are one hour. That is being done to um, reduce to a create some break times throughout the meeting and b to reduce the number of concurrence by uh, so that uh, if you have fewer concurrence you up the probability that someone or the, the attendee can go to more sessions so we have more one hour sessions than we would have if they were in an hour and a half so two hour and a half sessions for three hours buys you three tiers of sessions. Simple kind of example of the mathematics of that. In a round table though, whether they were in the hour and a half mode before or the hour mode this year, which we think might even work when we re return place-based, what essentially happens is the um, following. Um, let's assume, Rachel, can you bring three of you maybe, um, Mackenzie and uh, Asia and you on a screen and me on the same screen. Do I have to do something to be with you? You would have to log in to be on the screen too, but. Okay, okay. make believe I'm there folks, but bring up three people and I'm gonna be chair. And the one we just demonstrated, right, Police? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, just if you have three of you instead of two of you. Robert, if you have the login that Asia created last week, you could join Go over ahead. here as well. And then just, just imagine I'm there. There's the actual, the pictorial image when someone goes to a session, if it's a round table, it's gonna actually have a round table. And until we go live when these uh, boxes will fill the screen, which would have included me, um, uh, and Robert if he joins, uh, or Asia, um, that, that will fill the screen. You'll have the suggestion of a table and not a ballroom and not a theater uh, in the periphery, kind of the framing. And 
you know, that kind of a subliminal messaging we're using here. But let's say um, I am the chair of the technology and education SIG. And I say, well, um, welcome uh, to the round table. I'm so pleased that we have these uh, a, a series of papers that have been accepted for this round table. We really want to be able to generate some discussion between and among you. Um, I, I know you've uh, shared your abstracts. Many of you may have already shared your papers. Let's just open it up um, with, um, uh, with uh, 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 Mackenzie. We hear that you know the Scarrett group has been doing some cutting edge research. <laughs> and has built a platform uh, that is not only uh, uh, secure, but really innovative in a number of ways. And we'll start with Mackenzie, and then I'll ask Rachel, who's uh, worked on another unnamed platform that she thinks is the, uh, uh, really at the cutting edge. And they'll each talk about their technological innovations, and we'll say, we'll just open it up with, you know, maybe two minutes a piece or three minutes to, to capture that essence. And then each of you, because you have some familiarity with what you've done, either because you've shared your papers or your abstracts, which are the abstracts to the papers are already online in the ARA online program, which has been open since February 15th and will be available in the Scarrett platform. So essentially a conversation unfolds. We have always asked that roundtables not be just a shoe in for a formal presentation of a paper. It's not intended to be a paper session. When it is, it actually kind of un undercuts for attendees the, the true beauty of that. Does it ever happen? Undoubtedly. And it also, in our view, undercuts the uh, true beauty of a roundtable for participants, which is to share ideas, to talk, to ask each other questions. The chair and moderator would have some that they raise and that with attendees, that discussion unfolds. But just as you might uh, pick up your iPad, which I don't have before me, or this uh, iPhone, or some other broadcasting modality, or you might have had a handout, um, Rachel can show her iPresentation but she's not gonna give the presentation from the beginning to the end or a PowerPoint. She might have a prototypical graph or maybe a, um, a video that she'll be able to say, well, when I did this interview, because someone might say to her, well, you know, you've done this interview, but are you sure you weren't kind of uh, in the way you thought you would get doing an open-ended question that you really had some cueing bias. And she would say, well, I really thought about that when I did that interview, let me show you the excerpt. And so she'll have that capability. Of course she could present her whole paper or her whole PowerPoint, but that is not intended in a round table. Would it ever happen? Sure. I don't wanna say should, <laughs> should it not happen? It, it undercuts the, the, the purpose of having this discussion. So um, she might show one or two slides or maybe none at all, just as she might have prepared a, um, a handout that might have been you know, the key takeaways. And, and that flexibility exists uh, through the share screen in a way that um, you know, doesn't exist at a live round table, but we don't want this to migrate into just a paper session because that's not what you intended in choosing this modality. And it's not what the attendee wants. Uh, the, the, the excitement of these is that people can engage in discussion and conversation. And I will uh, be sure, as will Robert, we will, when we do this uh, live demonstration with our colleague <laughs> and in the orientation uh, sessions for newcomers and first time is next week, we'll go through these motifs again I, uh, I mean this sincerely, if you are feeling like, well, what could she have possibly meant? Just email me at flavine at A-E-R-A, -E Nathan put it in the, in the Q&A, and I am happy to uh, help you feel more comfortable with the modality 
including in the uh, virtual space. Mackenzie, do you think we should show the other type of live session at this time? Yes. So at this time, we will close out this demonstration of this particular view. And now we're back to the agenda window. We're going to click into an example that would be used for symposium sessions, a demonstration or performance, invited roundtables, invited speakers, and the structured poster session. So this is going to be the type of format utilized when a session starts with a larger attendance. And it will also be used as um, a session where you don't automatically have access to your microphone and camera if you're in the attendee role. So from the perspective on the screen, this is what you will see if you're in the chair, discussant, commentator, presenter, or a Q&A facilitator role. You'll notice that all the icons are at the top of the screen towards the right-hand side. And the one we're going to be focusing on is the one that says screen. It has a similar icon as the session format prior to this one where it looks like a computer monitor screen. So clicking that will bring up the same application window. You can choose to share whichever monitor you have open, or if perhaps you only have one screen you're working off of, you can choose a specific application that you have open on your computer. You have the ability to turn on your microphone and camera as you did in the previous session. Sorry if the audio was bad, I was on my microphone on two formats. So, Sharing the screen, I'll share an example of a PowerPoint. And you'll notice that you can still remain on camera. Multiple speakers, in fact, can stay on camera towards the bottom of the screen. And it does look small from my perspective, but that's because it's only showing a preview mode. If we were in the attendee role, this would be taking up the full screen. So not to fear, the attendees will be able to see your content and it'll take up the entire window on their page. It's only a small preview screen from the presenter sharing the view. In this format, there is a chat as well, a text chat. It's in the bottom right corner and it's a blue icon. And you'll see on the right hand side, the panel appears and there's a few different chat options. There's a public chat for everybody in the session. There's a presenter chat, which is a private location where anyone in the presenter role can communicate with one another. And there's a private chat option where during your session, all the attendees will be listed here. And if you would like to send a private message to one particular person, they, you would just click on their name and a private chat with that particular attendee would begin. Everybody in this session is going to have a dedicated technical lead from the Skerritt group side. So they will be making sure everybody who needs access to their mic microphone and camera have access to their microphone and camera. If you have any questions about sharing your screen, they will be able to assist you. And if you see that someone sends a comment in the audience and they would like to come on mic and camera and engage with you, you can ask that technical lead to give them access to their microphone and camera. So while they don't automatically have it when they join the session, they could be granted access during the session. So it can still be more interactive, but because we're intending on the audience being larger in this particular example, they will not by default have it in, in an attempt to avoid some distractions. So have any other specific questions come up for this one, Mackenzie? I guess I'll reiter reiterate quickly that just like the first example, breakouts are in the same place. So if the session had smaller breakout sessions in the top toolbar, you'll click breakouts and any breakouts pertaining to that session will appear in the window on the screen. All right, Rachel, one of the questions we're getting is um, how will people ask questions? So I know in the last demo we showed there was only the chat function. In this 
type of session, there is both chat and Q&A. So Rachel's just moved over to the Q&A session um, where attendees will be able to ask their questions. And as a presenter, you will have the right to be able to answer those questions if you wanted to just answer them via that Q&A area. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention about the sharing the screen. I know Rachel mentioned that you can either share your screen or an application. The difference there that's going to be important for the presenters is if you only have one monitor, we would recommend sharing an application. So for instance, if you are going to share a PowerPoint, um, you can just share the PowerPoint application. And even if you're switching back and forth between your PowerPoint and this browser, the attendees will only see the PowerPoint because that is the application that you are sharing. So that is just a clarification on the sharing the screen there. Um, let me see if there's anything else. We're getting again the question, um, Robert, how they can contact, uh, get contact info for people in their session. So if you are the chair or discussant, um, we sent out instructions last week about how to reach out to them. They can go back into All Academic and through the online uh, searchable programs, uh, see who those presenters are and um, set up those conversations. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then we have some questions asking for a panel discussion session, how should they handle the audience real-time questions? And what is the recommendation for that? In the, um, in the, in the sessions that are paper sessions or um, roundtable sessions, uh, the chair who is moderator and would typically do that function in a place-based um, session um, will execute that function just as they would in a place-based uh, meeting. Um, in a poster session, there is no chair. Essentially, attendees are coming and talking to the person whose paper is being presented in a poster. So they will be coordinating and welcoming, oh, hi, you know, in a, uh, um, in a poster session. In symposia, of, um, uh, I suppose, in symposia uh, uh, that we anticipate being over um, 100 in attendees, we're creating a, um, or an additional role, recognizing this could be very difficult for someone being an, an effective chair and facilitator to also, as we are doing right here, we have others um, um, uh, monitoring the uh, Q and A. Um, we are creating a uh, Q and A facilitator role, and there will that and there will be a person assigned to help monitor and raise questions from the Q and A. So the chair would then say, um, 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 what are you seeing in the Q&A as I might to Tony or Nathan or Laurie um, or has just happened here with Mackenzie? What other issues uh, should we raise? Now the chair will also, if the session turns out to be smaller in attendance, it's more likely to happen if smaller in attendance, the chair will have the power and capacity to actually bring anyone they wish onto the microphone. So if you expected 150 and there were 40 and you wanted others to have all, you wanted everyone to have their microphone live and you wanted to call on them yourself, you can. Um, but we've designed having a moderator in anticipation of, um, of, of larger sessions. Uh, I wanna clarify that um, um, I presentation um, is a presentation mode designed for content, uh, research content, things that were either in the invited or the vast majority of the ARA meeting is through paper submissions and session submissions. Business meetings are not intended. If the chair, the VP is otherwise would show some PowerPoint or the chair of a SIG or someone who steps up in, let's say the publications reception to 
um, honor the best reviewers from the seven journals each year. If they are going to show a slide, they'll just that's not a pre that's not a content pre presentation that should have a unique site site and be available later as as a as as research content. They're not being invited, nor frankly, even if they sought to use the I presentation, would we um, would we have them do so? If if a lecturer chose to do so and wanted to do so, we would make that available. Anyone who's presenting a substantive presentation or paper uh, in a symposium, of course, and, and, and by design, everyone who submitted a, uh, a paper submission, well, it's, it's, a, it's a presentation mode um, really tailored, <laughs> tailored for actual research presentations, whether in symposia, um, it's being used uh, by uh, us at AERA for the um, um, uh, structured poster sessions that we do for our uh, dissertation uh, fellows and for our early career fellows. Others are using it for similar content-driven equivalent of paper or other forms of substantive research that have an underlying, um, uh, an underlying paper. I'm kind of watching the chat about these other other things. It's not. It's it's a great modality. I suppose you could use it for anything. You could use it for exhibitors. I suppose, because it is a web-based product. But the nature of our gallery is a gallery of of research. That may be theoretical. It may be empirical. It may be a methodological. But it's 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 um, substantive work as as we know it in the field. Yeah, and just a couple um, additional things in this platform. We had um, some people asking if they would be able to see all the participants of their session. So Rachel, would you be able to go back to the tab where you can see that? So she's clicking on this private tab. And as you can see, it lists um, everyone who is in the session and what their role is. So all the presenters will be listed together. And then underneath, if there are any attendees, you will find them there. You can also search for people. So if, if you have a long list of attendees and you're looking for someone in particular, you can just start typing their name and that will pop up. Um, another question was just about the sharing the screen with how they get a full view there. Um, as Rachel mentioned, when you're sharing your own screen, you will just have a preview in the browser right here. But as a reminder, since you are sharing your screen or an application where you're sharing it from, that application is going to be full screen. So you will just be looking at that screen that you're sharing from in the full screen mode. Um, and you can essentially just ignore what is, is shown on the browser. Okay. Um, and then there are some questions about who will have access to their camera and microphone. So just to clarify, the first demo that we showed for those smaller sessions for you know, the paper poster sessions, round tables, everyone will have access to their camera and microphone. In these sessions for um, the symposia examples, it will just be the presenters who have access to their cameras and microphones. The audience will be recommended to send any of their questions into the Q&A and any chat into the chat box. Um, if you do need someone to be unmuted, that is where you would ask assistance from your host, who is gonna be your technical help. Um, but we do recommend, since these can be much larger sessions, that the attendees just send everything into the chat and the Q&A. Okay. And I think those are most of the questions for this particular um, session. Um, one thing just to note that I don't think we mentioned before is in this session, there will be a timer um, that will show you when the session is going to end. It will start counting down. And the session will end at the time that it is scheduled to end. So for all of the sessions in the conference, it is really important that you start on time and you end on time. Um, so please, when you go into your session, even if there's nobody there yet and you don't have any attendees, please go ahead and get started. We are recording all of the sessions. So they will be available on demand for people to view later. So don't worry about waiting for attendees to join. Please just get started at your start time and complete at your end time. With the exception of papers, right, Felice? Um, 
the paper sessions themselves will start at the start time and end at the end time. Oh, for recordings? Uh, paper sessions will be recorded. Poster sessions will not be recorded. Paper Posters. sessions. Thank yeah. you. Uh, 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 paper sessions and roundtables will be recorded. And then just one more thing. Um, we've gotten a few questions about what assistance the presenters will have. You will get some written information that gives you some screenshots and step-by-step -step for the sessions. So you will be receiving that information that you can keep as reference um, while preparing for your session and, and the day that you go live. The, the, uh, the platform is much more robust and secure. Someone asked about URLs. You don't have to send anybody a URL. <laughs> you don't have to have a URL. You don't have to track URLs of things that, uh, this is not software on your, you're essentially entering an environment. You're just think of this as the ARA uh, virtual, it is, conference center. Uh, you will enter it. You can come as, we hope people come early, often, and actually hang out. So that I saw some um, uh, questions that I thought or tried to answer around um, participants in a session getting together. So with many of our sessions, participants would ordinarily contact each other. And I suppose in a couple of years ago, that would have been scheduling a conference call. Um, um, Zoom or WebEx or GoToMeetings or one of those has become, you know, so so much more uh, daily activity that that can happen and it could happen tomorrow. I mean, you know, who, you, who, who are participating in the sessions or whenever you would like up to the meeting. We always have encouraged uh, people working together with uh, a presentation or a session is a form of um, professional collective activity to reach out and contact each other. Because of our environment, offering each of you um, the opportunity to do live chats with others up to 25 people. I don't think any of our sessions <clears throat> in one fell swoop have more than 25 people in them, um, although maybe there's one or two hanging in the woodworks, that <clears throat> if, for example, your session is on the 11th, and you're in the platform on the 8th or 9th or 10th, the chair or any of you who are in a session can say, I would love us to get together. Are you free today at 4 p.m. Eastern Savings Time? And you can ping each other and you can have, just like you're seeing here, and just really as you've experienced in other platforms, <clears throat> you can have a live meetup you can start whenever you want. You can end whenever you want. You can set the private button so that it's not in any form of public space. And you can prepare for your session within the platform on the 8th or 9th or 10th. And as I said, you wouldn't want to do it minutes before. Although <clears throat> I can't say I haven't broken that rule myself. Sometimes that's the, you know, it's just gathering together minutes before and that's when it happens. Don't do it 10 minutes before because 10 minutes before um, you need to be in the session space to test mics and videos and, and other things. But unlike other, so if you're, some questions were, are we doing this for you? Well, we're not doing it for you if you're doing it before the meeting as would have happened in any place-based meeting and will in the future happen in place-based meeting. We encourage you to do it on, in whatever way you would ordinarily would. If, however, um, uh, you're doing it during the meeting, you've got this marvelous capacity to actually have your own live meeting, live video meeting. You could do it in, with text too, but obviously live video meeting without your having to text each, you know, within the system, it will reach out to each of those persons when you pull them into your screen and say, can we get together? Maybe you'd offer two times and then you can, have your own planning meeting that's private right within the platform. You don't have to leave and set something else up and it's tailor-made for that. And so I hope that helps you uh, if you don't want to do it before. Now you can schedule it now to do inside the meeting. And then when you get into the meetings, uh, one of you has to schedule it for all of you, not just the chair. It can be anybody who's assertive enough to say for the time has come, we better get together. But ideally it is the chair because that is, you know, one of the responsibilities of a chair.
We did while we're answering questions, Felice, we did get a couple of questions um, asking what happens if they can't make the March 25th deadline. Um, <clears throat> Robert, what, what, um, well, if you, if you have a paper in the system, uh, which is all the paper submissions, that paper is your, is your paper of, <laughs> I suppose I would say, is your paper of record for presentation purposes. But if you are in the, um, if you're in the online paper repository, we give you quite a bit of time, maybe as much as, I don't remember the exact number, but you know, maybe six weeks after to, to put up a final paper. Um, uh, at, at that point, um, so we have papers in the system. In some traditions, your submission paper is your final paper. So it's not like there's a uh, empty bucket sitting there. All the paper submissions have papers in them. Um, uh, uh, the only thing that doesn't have the um, uh, underlying paper is if you were, if you're giving a paper in a symposia, um, <clears throat> when the symposia was submitted, there's only a brief abstract, I think maybe 150 words of your paper. And in that case, uh, we call them, I think we call them conversational papers or whatever, and they can be as full as you might want to make them as a regular paper is. Robert, what happens on the 26th though? We will go through and cross-reference between um, those who are registered and those who are in the system and make a determination as to which presentations um, will move forward and which will be sequestered? Well, no, that's a different. That's a different question. That's is if you haven't registered. If you haven't registered for the meeting and you uh, and there is only one presenting author, <clears throat> we will not have. We can not keep uh, un unless one present unless there is. Only presenting authors can present, which is always the case, and only presenting, and every paper has to have one registered presenting author. If you are a presenting author and you did not register by the 25th, you will, you will be removed as a presenting author and you will not be able to present. If there are no presenting authors registered for a paper, let's say it's a sole authored paper and you haven't registered, you will, your paper will be removed from the active program. It will be what Robert has just <laughs> described as, um, <clears throat> as sequestered um, and, um, um, and will not be, you know, at some point the program has to end. No one likes attending a session, sharing a session, or being with colleagues who then become no-shows and, and a council reaffirm that, which would have, which we reaffirmed to everyone who had an accepted paper for the San Francisco meeting, that was never to be. There's nothing different about this rule than has been the long-standing rule. Every attendee needs to register. Every presenter needs to register, and we, and one of the number one complaints about a place-based meeting is they walk into a session and there are no shows. We just can't have no shows. That's not, it's not collegial, it's not um, collaborative, and it is not you know, inclusive in a way that a meeting has to be. I think the question though, Robert, is let's assume a presenting author register did not upload by the 25th, but they want to, let's say by Monday the 29th, they, they wish they had uploaded and they missed the 25th deadline, but they're registered. We, we can upload, if they send their paper to the annual meeting uh, mailbox, we will upload it for them. Okay. So now I want you to hear what my very small staff is willing to do. This is, would be a heroic if we're talking about 7,000, <laughs> 7,000 revisions. It's, uh, it's, it is, um, it's very, it's impossible under the best of circumstances. So please take that 25th seriously for your symposia.
paper, which isn't there yet, and uh, any paper revisions, because there will become a point where it won't be possible to do if everyone breathes a sigh of relief. And I'd be first among you, I could assure you, to breathe that si sigh of relief, but recognizing our you know, <clears throat> mutual commitment uh, uh, to each other. So take that seriously. The one thing you've got to take seriously is uh, um, <clears throat> you can't be a presenting author unless you've registered by the 25th. A paper without a, pre pre without a presenting um, author uh, will, will be removed from the program and sequestered. I want to give, um, I want to bring Emily in now because I think we've had a lot of general Q&A and I've been talking a bit <laughs> about um, uh, inclusivity and welcoming and mutually supportive environments. And there's no issue more important about that is both for presenters of, with um, uh, disabilities as well as attendees with disabilities that are integral and significant in our community and a priority for uh, AERA. Uh, Emily? Thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, my name is Emily Badix. I am the Associate Director at the Longmore Institute on Disability. And I've been brought in as a short-term uh, access consultant to help make this conference as accessible as possible. I want to start out by thanking the Disability Studies and Education SIG, Special Interest Group. Um, in addition to their academic charge, they have done a lot of, uh, of extra work advocating for access at this conference um, that has been really uh, valuable and important um, labor. Um, First and foremost, you know, this is this is just really important stuff that I'm going to cover to make this conference more accessible for our colleagues with disabilities. Um, but I also think it's really important because, and I, I there's, you know, it's very clear right now, there's all kinds of adjustments that everybody's grappling with. And um, one of the ways that we can help and support that is to build in various access features that will end up benefiting all sorts of attendees. Um, I have a photo on the screen of a um, woman pushing a stroller down a curb cut. And that's an example of a feature that was built in for wheelchair riders and that you know all sorts of people use every day, parents with strollers and bicycle riders and skateboarders. And you're gonna find that's gonna be the case at a digital conference as well. I know myself, I'm a sighted person and I was at a conference where there was audio description where you provide audio cues for any sort of visual content. And I had a newborn baby and I was in and out of the room. And every time I was out of the room to nurse, I was like, this is great. I can, I can access all the same content, even though I'm not in the room. Uh, same is going to happen with a digital conference because of the realities of, you know, you're, you're in your household and your family's around and you might need to feed your kids uh, a meal or, or do some dishes. You're still going to be able to hear that content. And that's going to be a great example of we build these things in. And again, first and foremost for people with disabilities, but there will be broader benefits for everyone as well. Access, um, the access plan that AERA has provided, this is some of the features. Um, it, it is a screen reader accessible platform. ASL interpreters will be visible in those rooms, um, in the, the related rooms where ASL is just automatically provided. Um, that'll be ASL and access to live captioning for all plenaries, symposia, lectures, business meetings, and receptions. They are relying on AI captions, which have made a lot of progress in recent months, but are still not the same quality, certainly not as ASL interpreter if you're um, deaf and, and use read sign language um, or as live captioning where you can have a bit more reactions. So um, AI captions will be provided you know, for all, just as a default for all poster sessions, paper se sessions, round table sessions, and banquet tables. But if that's not adequate for you, uh, there is no guilt or worries about that. They will provide ASL with a request at an email that I'll provide on the last slide. Um, there will also be a couple of floaters of, uh, I'm saying couple, I don't, I haven't gotten the exact number, but there will be some floaters available that are ASL interpreters and captioners for those last minute 
sort of impromptu things that you want to be a part of and have access to. Um, so by all means, please make, make your requests. Um, there is recorded narration for eye presentation. Uh, and that's so that if you're going back later and accessing the gallery and people have provided those sort of audio tidbits, um, somebody who's deaf or hearing impaired will have access to that with the transcription. Um, we're asking as presenters that all eye presentations, PowerPoints, and multimedia need to be accessible. So, you know, if, the, if you're building it an eye presentation, there's a few things to think about because those will live on the eye gallery and, and we want anybody to have access if they come back later. With PowerPoint and multimedia, that's just about how you're gonna use it live to present it. And lastly, part of having those papers due at that earlier March 25th date is that um, that will allow ASL and captioners to access those papers and get key terms in order to prepare for the sessions. Um, if you're presenting or chairing with access, a few tips. You can say your name uh, every time you jump in. If there's any sort of more lively conversation where it's going to go back and forth, you can make it much more accessible for somebody following along by just saying, this is Emily. I want to chime in with blah, blah, blah. And then when you're done speaking, you can say check at the end that allows both, you know, if there's an interpreter trade-off that needs to happen, it allows the chair to know somebody can come in. And if you have a panelist who their disability might be, that you know, reading social cues are more challenging. It's going to help them feel more comfortable jumping in there. It's it really encouraged that chairs play a more active role in any of the sort of more casual discussion-based moments to bring better access. And also really leaving space for slower responses. You don't want to just, any questions? No, moving on. That doesn't leave enough time for somebody who needs to relay their questions through a sign language interpreter to get in there. Um, or maybe who just needs a little bit more processing time. So sort of slowing, slowing the time is an important access feature. Invite access check-ins at the beginning. Uh, audio self-descriptions, I didn't do that today because I spaced, but normally I would start my presentations by saying, I'm a um, white woman, I've got my hair in a side braid, I'm sitting in front of a messy bookshelf. Just a really quick sentence that gives a little bit more contextual information for somebody who can't see the screen. Um, and that's also a great opportunity to invite your panelists, if they'd like to, to provide pronouns. Um, you can audio, you should audio describe your presentations, both live as you present and in your recorded narration for the eye presentation gallery. Um, so for example, uh, I have a meme on the screen and here's a meh example of how you would provide some audio description that, that doesn't really do much good. You could say, um, I've got this meme of some monkeys and there it's, it says like me looking at the F my kid got for the math homework I solved. Now you don't really know why the monkey's there. That was kind of like, okay, you maybe were compliant because you told me that there was something on the screen, but you didn't really pull somebody in who can't see it to the joke. Whereas if you're presenting and you say, okay, I've got this slide up right now and uh, you know, sitting near its offspring, there's an adult baboon who's clutching a paper and he's deeply focused on it. And the baby is, there's a baby ba baboon and he's looking off in the distance, kind of waiting for the parent's response. And uh, the text at the top reads, me looking at the F my kid got for the math homework I solved. That's an example of something you just kind of want to weave into your presentations. And as you do, as you build those presentations, really think through, you know, what, what visuals matter? How are you going to, to offer that description? You don't want to be thinking about that on the spot. You want it to be, you know, great access and not just sort of like technical compliant access that doesn't really bring somebody in in the same way. Um, as you set up your presentations in eye presentation, you have the option at when you add an image to click image properties. And then there's a, on the image info tab, there's a space for alternative text. And that's where you could also write that information in. But again, even if you write that present information in there, that's great for people who will see your presentation afterwards on iGallery, but you'd still want to present it live, saying these things out loud. If you have a multimedia piece, ideally you're adding um, open audio description directly into the clip. There's a lot of great examples on YouTube where you can learn more about how to do this and what this looks like. 
But if you're not that tech savvy, I know this is a pretty daunting moment if you're not tech savvy and I don't want to scare you by saying one more thing. It, a very low tech uh, solution is just to provide a little pre-show before your multimedia clip. So, you know, I'm about to play a clip. You're going to see some um, coffee bean farmers and it's on their coffee, uh, coffee bean farms. And it's mostly sort of B-roll of people picking and collecting these coffee beans while we interview various talking heads. Um, that's going to just give somebody a little bit more richness to take in that clip that they're going to listen to. Um, don't forget to plan for this audio description in your timing. Add captions to all your multimedia. There's a link, washington.edu backslash accessibility backslash videos backslash. And that is a really great resource for how you could add them if your video is on YouTube, how you can add them if it's on Vimeo or Facebook um, so that you can just come prepared with an accessible video. Avoid jargon and use simple language. I know that's a really hard thing to promote in academia where we love our t key terms and our acronyms, um, but that's going to be a hurdle for a, a number of different disabilities that we want to pull more people in. We want to share this information with more people. So push yourself on that regard. For all of your presentations, use big fonts, 24 point colors that have high contrast. You can test by doing a print in grayscale to make sure it's visible. Be cautious of slide animations and strobing GIFs. You know, it might feel fun for the little laugh you felt in or the cool flashiness, but it's really not going to be fun if somebody has nausea or a migraine as a result. It's just not worth it. Use descriptive links if you have any handouts. So for example, uh, the way that screen readers for the blind and visually impaired read text out loud, uh, a link that says click here, if you have several in them, they tend to move from link to link um, as, as it's sorting through the document. So a click here doesn't really give any of the context somebody needs, whereas a, a hyperlink that the text says this link connects to info about descriptive links, that's much more helpful. This is a lot and just the tip of the iceberg. We're, we've got handouts that should be coming out and available shortly that will provide a lot of resources for you to learn more, dive in. And, um, but most importantly, if you have any access needs that are you know, not sort of the figuring out the system and platform, if they're access needs related to uh, a disability and something that we can support with, um, please don't hesitate to uh, contact access at aera.net. -E um, AERA is, is really committed to learning and growing. It's going to be an ongoing process for sure. There's going to be more growth and learning to do after this year's conference. Um, but please, if you're a colleague without a disability, find ways to just open up and support your colleagues with disabilities by embracing this opportunity. Uh, and if you're a colleague with, with disabilities, um, you know, please ask for the support you need and um, share your experiences so that, um, you know, AERA can learn. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we'll um, <clears throat> see if there's any uh, key questions that may have been answered in the Q&A because three members of the team have been answering sequentially. Um, but uh, Tony, are there some sort of broader issues that, um, that we should uh, particularly capture or others framing some big picture issues that would without us elongating the time that almost 400 of you are now with us um, uh, that you've uh, given to uh, our shared meeting? So this was probably addressed earlier, but a number of people have asked um, once they have access to the platform on April 2nd, uh, will they be able to practice? I said uh, in the chat, but I may not have said uh, orally, and I'll turn this over to uh, uh, Asia or uh, one of our SCARA team. Our SCARA team is working on whether inside the platform or outside of the platform, uh, what you might view to be a practice uh, opportunity. Uh, you will be able to um, 
um, get into the platform for point of view of opening up your um, your content card where you can, if you didn't have preferred pronouns when you registered and you want them, you could add them, where you, where you might be able to add special interests or other things that would become searchable um, so you could find others if you wish to. You, of course, don't have to find anybody by hitting a private screen. Um, <clears throat> you'll be able to go into the gallery. Uh, uh, whether there's a, uh, Scarrett is putting a lot of attention into whether there can be a, um, uh, a live practice mode, whether inside the platform or just, um, or just otherwise accessible through the website. And I'll turn this over to Asia, the Scarrett group in a moment. What I want to say though, is that what you're actually doing isn't different. What you are actually doing yourself isn't different from how you would um, uh, present in any of those other um, essentially um, uh, one sign. This is, this is a one sign on entry but whether if you were in uh, WebEx or go to meetings the, or, or Zoom, it's a more stable platform because it's, it's, it's driven by very powerful servers. There is actually live technical support um, that many other platforms, including uh, without poor mouthing any of them, the ones I've just named, I haven't found. And if someone else has, they should let me know. Um, uh, so this is a full service environment um, uh, and you will, you will, as a presenter, though, not find this, oh my gosh, this is new, the functionalities and more, uh, including there being a button for the chair to be able to use if there's, um, I'm in trouble, can you get me X? We don't expect that, but, but that will go uh, uh, directly to the Scarrett support team. Asia? Hi, Felice, I can take this one, it's Rachel. Um, we are going to try to set up some different practice sessions for the speakers and presenters to utilize. And as soon as we have those set up, we will be sending out an email with all that information. So we will be in touch as soon as that is finalized. The, uh, the hard part, I will say, uh, being part of the shared team here, um, is not the technology, it is that we have so many persons in so many roles, it's how to offer a demonstration site. If, if more than a thousand of the 13,000 persons in a role as chair, discussant, paper presenter, or whatever else, want in at the same time, it's not going to be as experiential. So that's the trick of how to um, make this accessible uh, when we have so, so many participants in a large meeting. If this were a intensive research conference for 50 or 60 or 300 people. Many of you may have experienced some demo sites for smaller meetings. It's, um, it's far less formidable to figure out what the simultaneous users can be. Tony, any other? Yeah, yeah a, number of, um, a number of session chairs are asking uh, where exactly in all academic can they find contact information for session participants? Yeah, do, uh, Robert, maybe, do but, chairs have the view with the emails? Not at the moment. Okay, we we're, will, gonna, we're seeing that. Um, we, will, we will activate that for them. Yeah, we're gonna, and we may try to do it actually for all attendees within a session. I mean, you can't be anonymous to each other. That's kind of dysfunctional and, it, and it's too time consuming Googling and finding emails. So I, uh, I uh, uh, if we can, I would like every attendee, if we can make the modification in all academic to be able to see within a session, um, uh, those participating in a session. Uh, how was it done before? the chair would go into, um, you know, might have had that information or the organizer might have had that information on submitting. Sometimes the chair is the, and the organizer are one in the same in a session submission. 
but in a paper submission when the chair is identified after the papers are clustered, uh, the chair of that or the chair of a round table would not have that available um, as with, with those who submitted sessions. And that's a requirement of submitting sessions. It can't be for the other two motifs because the backbone is a paper, but um, I, uh, if we can do it, we'll do it as soon as possible. And uh, I think that's one of the wisdoms that comes through um, working through what, what everyone would want to have in a, in a virtual environment. I also encourage and said this, AERA does not require um, uh, persons to share their papers. I will say some, somewhat counterintuitive for a conference uh, when meetings were created um, in the prior century, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, a paper author would bring copies of the print paper to a paper room and they would sell for, I don't know, I remember 25 cents. Many of you might have remembered a dollar. And through, through this, the end of last century, through the 90s, that was a typical thing that the paper was provided. Somehow this, uh, we've gotten into scholarly association meetings, having this privatized motif with work that is at the point at which you've decided to make a public presentation. We have strong rules with respect to fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. We encourage you to use the I presentation mode because you get a unique citation and things are time, time and date stamped. We are very strict about whether well, paper repository. ARA does not take lightly and has not taken lightly any form of plagiarism that happens in journals, in informal conversations, even if you didn't put your paper up, but Certainly we encourage those in a session. I mean, it's like stabbing in the dark if you're gonna have a conversation about something and you don't have, you're clueless about some, what, what someone might have been saying before you're hearing it for the first time. We don't require it. The more you require, the more pushback one gets, but you know, that these are, meetings are opportunities for collegial exchange and interaction and I, knowledge building. So we very much encourage the sharing of you all sharing your papers, at least with each other. We encourage you using the paper repository, which also gives you a unique DOI. We had 5,000 papers uh, in the repository. The vast majority are using the paper repository for a paper they can upload after the annual meeting. I mean, polish off, not a new paper. When you publish that work, you can go back into the repository and add the final citation and the DOI for that. And what a better way of, as a community, collaborating on work in the, um, in the knowledge production process. Uh, is that it, Tony? Um, I will share uh, one more question, okay. um, which also may have been addressed earlier. Um, someone asked whether it, if it's possible within the platform for attendees to Zoom into a presentation that is being shared by your presenter? No, because you wouldn't be able to have your camera on in two places at the same time. Right, exactly. Right. It's hard to imagine why one would want to do that, but it's not, you can't even be- Well, the, be yeah, the, re the reason given was that sometimes pre presenters use small fonts. Presenters in there in what they're showing you small font. Yes, yes. Zoom in as in enlarge. Oh, oh zoom in enlarge. Oh, I thought you meant zoom. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, I uh, well, definitely you can do that in. Um, in it's a with functionality. It's a functionality within the interactive presentation. Uh, it's also a functionality on their computer where they could make what's being displayed on the screen larger. Yeah, that's right. We sh um, Emily, we should maybe hit some of those functionalities in a, 
in our fact sheet about how uh, viewers can use their own desktops if they're not conversant with making the view larger. I think within iPresentation, it's a functionality of, um, well, it's, it's, it's at your desktop, but it's also, I think, a functionality in preparing your presentation. All right, well, I'm saying all right, although I wish we could continue to learn from you what else you would like to know. You've got various ways of reaching us. We are gonna have these uh, um, additional, I won't call them small sessions. They can be as large as people want to attend. Um, and we're gonna have this live demonstration around seeing one of our colleagues make an eye presentation. And we'll take some time at the beginning of that session and through the question answer to show that if you've created an eye presentation, including if you wanna use your own PowerPoint within it, how you um, uh, share your screen and show it, which is really, I said in the Q and A, um, you open it in a web browser and instead of going to your desktop and picking up PowerPoint, you just open that browser and you do that, you know, a few minutes in advance of presenting. So thank you everyone for uh, coming. Uh, we hope this was of help and use to you. We are really excited about doing the meeting for and uh, with you on April 8th through 12th. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out as others, other things strike you. I wanna thank all of my uh, Scarrett colleagues and Emily and uh, my colleagues at AERA for once again um, seeking to offer these sessions in a way that maximizes um, your success um, who've attended this meeting today or might view it subsequently. And with that, we uh, will conclude. Thank you.